Hello, Internet. So nice to see you. We are here today again for another music theory talk. If you are watching us, say hi in the chat, say hi in the comments, say hi. <laughs> Just wave the, your hand in the air and say hi, no problem. Tell us where you're coming, where you're watching us from. I always want to see where you guys are, are watching us from. Yeah, I know. Okay, so today we're gonna have a special guest. You've already seen this special guest. And every time this special guest comes around, I get people after the live stream writing me, whoa, that lady really knew what, he was, what she was talking about. So without further ado, let's go immediately and let me introduce you to that lady, <laughs> OK? That lady is songwriting expert Diana de Cabarus. Hello, Diana. Hello. That internet. <laughs> so, Good to see so, you all. Hello in the chat there. Diana. Diana. And, and, uh, by the uh, way, by the people, way people, people, who people who don't know, know Diana and I are, are, are quite a lot, quite a lot of, 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 of time zones, time zones apart. apart. So, so, the scheduling the thing the is thing always is like, like, hey, can we make it this hour? No, that hour is 4 a.m. in the morning for me. It's bath time. Yeah, so, yeah so, so, so what is so it? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, I'm, a... I'm, 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 I'm in, in the Denver, Denver time, time zone, mountain time, time and Diana, Diana is in London. London. So, so what time is it in London, London right now? Right it now. is um, it's 6 p.m. It's the it's perfect good. time for a sociable discussion about so songwriting and composition. Fantastic. Fantastic. OK. okay. My microphone uh, is uh, hot. Let me turn that down a little bit. Your mic, yeah, is, mic hot. is hot. Well, that's not a problem. Yeah. I can raise mine and lower yours a little bit. Not a problem. Take it, take it easy. And that could be better. And yes, there is some echo. We, we, know, we know, guys. We, we are trying to work around the software that allows us, us to stream. And there's always a problem like that. But don't worry, because Diana is going to do most of the talking anyway. And there is no echo in her microphone. So, Diana. When we were discussing the topic for this um, for this live stream, where Diana came up with this idea of um, talking about how what is the defining element of a story and how this um, applies to music. Okay, so the whole idea here is that your songs tell a story. Okay, so Diana. Let's start hot here. What is the defining element of a story and how do you think about that? And by the way, guys, whenever you have questions, ask them in the chat or the comments and we're going to answer them later. Okay, so defining element of a story is actually in a way you can sum up in, in so concisely that it's, it's almost dumb. So you could say that the defining element of a story is something changed. So if I'm just sitting in my room, nothing happens, then there's no story. If I'm just staying on one chord, there's no story. So in a way that's so obvious, it, it's one of those kind of things that's almost banal because it's such an obvious thing to say, but it actually becomes very useful because it gives you a really precise way of exploring what change there is, how that change happens, how much change we want. And instead of the idea of creativity being like, oh, I can't come up with an idea. You become the person that's just making decisions about how much change is going to happen. So you're managing the change for your listener. And this is exactly what's happening in every movie or every, every uh, novel. They're managing the rate of the progression of change through the film uh, in terms of how many characters they are, there are what is happening to those characters, the level of jeopardy those characters might be in how the jeopardy gets resolved. Um, and so all of that is, is paying close attention to how much change there is. If there's too much change, you end up confused and you can't follow what's happening. If there's too little change, you get bored. And so uh, when I was a kid, we used to have this TV series called Casualty in the UK, and it had this very recognizable theme tune. I don't know if any, anyone from the UK know, knows that kind of, it was a little bleepy theme tune that suggested hospital machines. And it would always open in some kind of environment, like a kid's party or a municipal swimming pool. And you'd be like, oh, no, what is going to happen? Because, you know, the clues in the name, casualty, someone's going to end up in hospital. It was a little bit like the Scooby-Doo cartoons. The plot's sort of always the same. But you don't quite know exactly how the accident's going to happen. 
whom it's going to happen to, how the people around them are going to react. And that's why they could have essentially the same basic plot for however many years Casualty was on for. So yes, something changed, but what? And I, yeah. Exactly. It's the, it's the rate of change. I mean, there is no story if we stay on the same situation. And so for a story to happen, there must be some change. And then what we can do is to decide the direction of the change and the rate of the change. And you guys will not, uh, I mean, that's a great idea because we have the same idea in music theory, you know, they have the harmonic rhythm, meaning how many chords change in a, in a bar and all this kind of thing. And how, how many time, um, how fast you change from one key to another, for instance, the modulation speed. And if you go too fast, then you, then you give whiplash to your listeners, essentially <laughs> like, hey, we were here, now we are there. But if you go too slow, there is not, not enough change to keep uh, to keep people interested. And and this seems to be, by the way, something important for like like you were saying for for TV too, for for movies too, etc. I was um, I was watching a show the other actually yesterday evening on a, on 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 Amazon Prime actually. Okay, and it's, it's a cartoon show. And um, reading the reviews of the cartoon show, they say that some, some people were saying that it's an unholy mess with uneven pace, which is exactly that. It's um, the pace in that cartoon, it's, it's very uneven. But at the same time, that's one of the things I liked about that. Okay. Meaning that, that from a moment to another, you can be somewhere else, essentially, and the whole tone can change in a second. That's something I like. So that's the thing. First of all, we manage the rate of change, but second, the rate of change that you like depend on you. And even, and even how much the rate of changes changes itself. So if you go slow, then fast, then slow, then fast, then slow, then fast, or you go at an even pace all, the, all throughout, depends on what you like, and you control that too. Okay, so for all the listeners at home right now, one thing I want you guys to do is just think about a song or the last thing you've seen on TV, okay? Just, just a moment and think about at this rate of change idea okay it is way more powerful than you think just thinking about that of course diana is way more to tell you about that okay but we just want to make sure that the basic concept is there so diana how would you manage this rate of change well um before i start on that i i want to just pick up on something you said about the fact that you liked the cartoon having an uneven pace but when you describe the comment of the person that didn't like it their their comment almost had a flavor of being angry like they were like ah they were so very frustrated with it and that's it's because if our expectations aren't met in a way that feels satisfying we do get sort of agitated and irritated um and that's very personal so one of the things that's interesting about this is that if you think about the pieces of music you really love that have they one one reason why you find them satisfying is that they're, they're going to have a rate of change that you find really satisfactory it's going to be neither too fast nor too slow and this is a great way of developing your own style so i'm quite easily bored and relatively impatient and so i do like putting a lot of things into my material and sometimes there's just too much and i listen back and i realize it was fun for me when i was making it but now it just is too cluttered and i've got to pull some things out um, but it's very personal and it's one of the ways that you can be really confident in developing your own style because the rate of change across the different elements in the song and in the music, in the narrative and lyrics and in the musical elements, they're just going to be a reflection of your taste. So I think it's very, it's a very nice way to think about your compositional voice. A lot of the time it's easy to get caught up in whether I'm writing original music or what that means. And if I'm writing a song that has four bars of G followed by four bars of C followed by, you know, uh, D and C and G, is that just a really boring average song? Well, no, because there's going to be all kinds of other decisions you'll be making about the rate of change that can make that very standard progression sound absolutely great. So I think it's a helpful way to consider our own creativity. Now, when it comes to how we might think about that, we've got the lyrics side of things and we've got the music side of things, the lyrics side of things might divide into the meaning of the lyrics and the sound characteristics of the lyrics. So the meaning of the lyrics is gonna be the plot. 
And as a very quick example, if the basic plot of a song can be summed up very often in one line, like a breakup song might be, we were together, now we're apart and I'm sad. That's the entire plot. How do we, how, and if we want to manage the rate of change of that story, um, I'm going to use a Driver's Licence by Olivia Rodriguez. Um, the key thing is not to restate the same thing in each verse. So that, even though that, that story can be summed up very, in a very concise way, and even though this is not a new story, we can, it can still be told in a captivating way or in a way that people are going to connect with. So in the first verse for that, she says, I'm driving around my neighborhood with my driving license. I thought this was something we we're going to be doing together, but you're not here and I'm devastated. So she's sort of giving us a setup and she's giving it in a, in a visual way. There's like, a, if it was a theater, there'd be a little, you know, we could, we could pitch what was happening or if it was a comic book, we could draw that scene out. Then in the chorus, there's her emotional reaction to that, how she feels about it. She's, she can't believe that he's, he'd be okay with her not being there anymore. She just can't believe that if, it, if, if he was authentic at the time, he's now totally fine with it. So that's her emotional reaction. In the next verse, she doesn't say, oh, I'm so sad about this. And I, she doesn't repeat in any way what we already heard. She says, my friends are tired of hearing about it. So she's giving us another perspective and another point of view. And that is, it's like have bringing in another spotlight to shine, to reveal a new part of the, if we, you know, if we think about this theater analogies, it's like a new light came on and it revealed a new part of the theater that we hadn't seen before. So she's uh, developing it by giving us a new angle, but that's not simply a restatement. And then she goes on to say, but I'm sorry for them because they're never going to know you like I did. Now that's not the same thing as saying, I, we were together now we're apart and I'm sad. It's another, it's another angle on it. And then we get the chorus and that, that restate, you know, now we've, the, the way that she feels about it has been slightly recolored by what we've heard in between. So that's an example of how you might think about just very, in very brief, how, you, how to think about plot development. There's a lot of other ways you can consider that. For example, let's say you're roughing out an idea for a song and I highly recommend doing this, by the way, open brackets. I used to start with line one and then try and write the song. Oh, terrible results. If you, if you kind of group the information that you want to put in each section and then work out how to make it sound nice, that's much better. Anyway, um, so let's say we've got a song about somebody who, uh, and, and verse one says, this is a very bad guy. He held up a bank at gunpoint. And then verse two says, uh, this is this guy stabbed somebody. He's a terrible guy. And then the third verse says, this guy burned a house down. He's a terrible guy. We've basically said the same thing in three verses and we're ha we haven't gone anywhere. We've just given different examples of the same thing. And that's not really development. Whereas if we're like, this guy's a terrible guy. He's in love with the mayor's sister, but she's married to somebody else. And each of those is a separate verse. Now we've got a story that's developing because every verse is adding to the situation and it's adding to the jeopardy or the possible tension that we would want to accrue. So that's a very brief example of what counts as development and change in a plot versus what counts as restating and repetition. There's lots of great other ways we can do this, but just to make the difference, when it comes to the actual sound of the lyrics, there are things like rhyme scheme and rhyme sound. So one section may have, I don't know, an A, B, A, B rhyme scheme, or it might be four lines. Then another section, you know, you might have an A, A, B, B rhyme scheme, or the lines might be slightly longer, or you might have a different number of lines in that section. And all of that will change how it feels and how it flows. The rhythmic, uh, the rhythmic structure of the lines might be different. So some songs have got very, very precise rhythms to the phrases. Jack Johnson's song, Banana Pancakes, is like every phrase, if you see the music, it's just because I happen to be teaching it to somebody this week, it's exact, exactly the same rhythm. So I don't think you could do that unless you were doing it on purpose. We, we naturally sort of match a little bit, but so you can take a very, very definite rhythmic pattern and repeat that exactly in one, one part of the song and then change it in a, to a different one, another part of the bar. You can do things like change which beat of the bar your phrase starts on. So maybe in the verses, you're gonna have a one, two, three, four, da, 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 and it's coming in on the end of four. And then maybe in the chorus, you're gonna just come in hard on one, and that's gonna feel a bit different. So those are ways of changing the sonic qualities of the lyrics. 
it's almost at that point oh yeah i've got this weird thing on my computer when i do this it makes a bubble hi <laughs> um apologies for the fireworks what, so what's um, happening right now <laughs> what, what i don't that? know i've got no idea i've got no idea how that what just happened fireworks just came out of my head on the computer right so i'm not going to be swayed by that though so we in the in when we're thinking about the sound characteristics of the lyrics it's almost like now we're thinking about the lyrics as another instrument that's and there's going to be a rhythm that's happening and there's going to be pitches and of course there's the melodic characteristics of the vocal melody and, and what's happening with that in different sections so we've got just to recap we've got thinking about the plot and how we manage the change of the plot in terms of the number of people where we are what's happening what like extra pressure is being ladled on and different bits of the song and we have got the sound characteristics of the lyrics and there are things that we can do to both of those so that we we get enough change to keep the listener paying attention then we have all the musical elements and even if you've only got one guitar or one piano keyboard and that's how you're going to arrange your songs there's still tons of cool decisions to make about the rate of change so an obvious one which tomato mentioned earlier is the chords and how many chords we're hearing at any one time so the chords could be the the kinds of um things to do decisions to do the chords is going to be what type of chord world are we going to be in are we going to be in a very diatonic world are we going to be in quite a non-diatonic more psychedelic world are we going to have how many chords are we going to have in each section are we going to have two just a couple of chords in in or a little turn around in one section and then open it out in another section are the chords how long are they going to last for what is the rhythm going to be are they going to change on the and or are they going to change on the beat are they going to last for two bars and then half a bar half a bar like take me to the river e e e e d a you know is there going to be a little propulsion right at the end of the line when we're mainly on one chord or is it going to be uh kind of what you hear a lot in conventional pop music nowadays which is four chords chord one chord two chord three chord four and then that just repeats so there are all those decisions relating to the chords if we went into detail in any of those there would be we could proliferate with well we're from this we're on this chord what next chord could i go to you know depending on what kind of vibe i want and and some of that is going to be to do with where you want the spotlight to be so if your verse is you want everyone to concentrate on what's happening in the verse and you don't want them you want them to ha follow especially the first verse maybe you're not going to be doing anything too crazy with the chords but then if you want to catch people's attention again you're maybe going to drop in maybe you're going to change something in the chords and that's going to automatically refresh people's attention so on the other hand if you were being like you know if you were going it's going to be quite hard to concentrate on the lyrics there because so that's that's going to be maybe a bit too much change so but then again it depends you know um and with all of these things the rate of change on one of them it, it's almost like you could imagine having a bank of dials of one's melody one's chords one's you know maybe you've got some sub dials rate of change chord color where i'm playing it on the guitar um what the rhythm is what the strum is going to be what the melody is let's say i don't change the melody very much now i can withstand more chords without feeling disturbed or without feeling like it's too much or if i am um, keeping the chords the same i'm going to want probably slightly more interest coming from the melody and there's actually a great example of this from the last couple of years is the song heat waves by glass animals basically the same chords all the way through but very distinct melodies from one section to the other section and another attribute of this song is that it's not just a four chord uh, it's not four chords it's eight chords well it's like chord one two three four then it has a different chord one and the same chord two three four but it's so it's it's a, quite a subtle distinction but it's enough to to leave him quite a lot of scope for drawing very different very distinctive melodies in the two parts of the songs and then in 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 a case of a song like that there's also lots and lots of arranging and instruments and um that has that particular song has 11 instruments you know when you listen to it you might think it has four or five or something but it's by the time he's done there's 11 different things happening so that's another way that he's he's creating change in that song so but back to back to our example so we've got chords and we've got all the things that we could decide to do with chords we've got rhythm we have got what how many subdivisions we want to have in the rhythm are we gonna in, in even if we, if we we keep the tempo the same but we could have a melody that's mainly accenting longer notes in one section then it becomes shorter we could have a strumming pattern that 
goes from a half time feel to a you know double time feel we're still in the same basic pulse but we're just dividing it differently when it comes to arranging the chords and and choosing where we're going to do it obviously even on guitar we've got loads of choices uh you, got, you know standard open chords bar chords triads moody chords down here oh that's nice all this kind of thing there's how we're going to pick it how we're going to strum it just, so everything like this changes our perception of what's happening so if you've got an e chord for four bars you can play that in a way that we almost don't realize it's the same chord and that's going to affect our perception of how much change we need to hear so i'd be yeah i'm sure tomaso you have some great observations to make about your favorite ways of creating change across some of these musical elements well like you were saying the, the change can be a different level it can be at the if you want at a quote unquote deeper level so you can change the chords like you were saying right now it can be at a quote unquote superficial level there's nothing superficial about that it's just a metaphor um where you change the way you play the you play the chord or you can change the rhythm so you have different kind of uh, elements that you can change okay i wanted to comment in, on one of the things you said much earlier though because it was so interesting about um that olivia and rodrigo song olivia rodrigo song um about the, the verse being about the same thing so there is no change in the actual objective situation but there is a change of point of view in the lyrics and that that is pretty much the same we do in cinema for instance okay when you take a scene from an angle and then you put the camera on a different angle and you show the same scene from a different angle from a different point of view so like looking from the protagonist and then looking from the point of view of one of the other people in the scene and um and that's a change <laughs> essentially so an, an important thing here is to to, to explain to, to have in mind that when we talk about change we don't always mean that something actually change in the story in the plot the change could be the point of view that we are talking about the change could be the way we are talking about it okay um if you guys oh yes that, that that's that's exactly the right comment here it's like Quentin Tarantino is good at that over time <laughs> okay it shows the same story seen from one point of view then you see the, you see another story and then you see the same part of the story from another point of view exactly that exactly that so it's not it's just not the story true. it's I, how I you tell the story yeah but it, it's also sometimes adding to the pool of meaning can be a nice way of thinking about it because in the in the example I was like oh this guy stabbed somebody and he burned a house down not that much is being added to the pool of meaning but if um this happened and I was thinking we're going to be this way now my friends are tired of hearing or like that other the other lamp that gets turned on in the theater or the new camera angle there's an addition to the pool of meaning so that's what is that weird thumb about what what are you what are you doing with I, don't know. I don't know i don't know i i thought it only happened in zoom but it's happening on restream as well i'm just going to stop gesticulating apologies <laughs> this is entertaining <laughs> also because it, it happens i mean not, if you notice it happens when you are giving a pretty good idea <laughs> okay so you were you were explaining something and it was a pretty good idea and the computer gives you the thumb up yeah it's like yeah great love Ar it artificial <laughs> intelligence to the rescue here <laughs> It's a rare thing when one's electronics agree. So, so at, at least, uh, at least our new electronic overlords agree with you. <laughs> that's, that's something. Yeah, that's something. So, anyway, uh, adding to the pool of meaning, I would like to know more about that. Can you? Could you? Suppose somebody just come in the conversation right now, and they hear you say "adding to the pool of meaning." Can you explain them what you mean, what in, you mean in a few words? words? So. I think it's just an expression I've adopted. It's not like a known thing, um, but it it it's about what is the totality of what we know now, and how does that change our understanding of it, or enrich our understanding of it, or deepen the emotional heft of that experience. So the more different perspectives we have on something, typically the deeper our understanding is going to be, and uh, the more fully we're going to experience it. 
so if I'm always just looking out the same window, I'm only gonna my what I can see and perceive is is not is just is still gonna be limited by that. But if I've been outside and walked around, now I know that there's kind of a lamppost down there, there's a tree there. If I needed to draw a picture, it would be a more expanded picture. I'd have more more context. That there's more kind of visual information. So from a songwriting point of view, the the pool of meaning is what is how much do we know about all aspects of the situation now by the time we've got to the end of the song? And if the answer is we've just had a couple more examples of the same thing, then the pool of meaning is not being substantially increased. Whereas if we have different perspectives or a memory from a different time, so quite often there's a, a tactic in the bridge is to talk about a different time period and um, or to bring in, to kind of move the, the perspective somehow from far to near, whether that's far to near in terms of distance or far to near visually in terms of the detail that we can see or far to near in terms of, of time. So all of those are adding to the pool of, of meaning. And I guess one could one could think about this musically in terms that you would, let's say you start off with a G and a C chord, and then in the chorus you have some different chords. Now the pool of chord meaning has been increased. So either we've been, either it's been, in that, that example of G and C, we could be in the key of G or we could be in the key of C. Um, but then if we have some other chords that come in in the chorus, now it's going to give us, if we're going to, maybe we've moved into a different key altogether. Maybe we're in D mixolydian, um, or maybe we've just changed completely or so, but whatever, even if we're not obviously thinking about this as we go along in terms of our, our mind and our experience, the pool of musical meaning has expanded. So that's, I suppose what I mean by that. Does that, um, is that a satisfactory expansion? That makes very much sense. And um, it's something we have done all the time in music. Uh, I mean, it doesn't apply only, only to lyrics, it apply also to instrumental music. Uh, there are actually specific uh, styles and situations where, where this is desirable and done deliberately. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make an example, honestly. Okay, because the idea is, uh, um, for instance, you know, I like a lot of Baroque music, okay? Now, I like Baroque music because of specific things. Not, not so much for the harpsichord all the time, because the harpsichord starts to be annoying after a while, but it's more for their, how they manipulate melodies. So, for instance, they take a, they, they, they take a, um, a melody, so something... I'm going to completely improvise this thing. <laughs> so, they take something like... In, Something like that, so I can I can put a bit more. Yeah. Um, something like that. Okay. Um, I read that there are some relationship inside this melody because I just played one thing, but I played it in two different ways. Because first I'm playing, and then I'm playing the inverse of that moved up. Those two melodies are the same, they're just reversed. When one goes up, the other goes down, and I just move the second one a bit higher to fit a chord progression. Okay, that this is what people that were composing Baroque music were doing all the time. <laughs> That's a, a set of chord progressions, if you want, and a set of standard melodies, and they were fitting one into each in, into each other and, and making those variations. Okay. So Already, I'm exploring one concept in two different ways, and that's why the melody feels like it's together. But then later, after playing all these things, then they typically they, they start doing something like they put some filler in, in and then they move around. They move to another key, and in the new key, they play the same melody in another key. That's what they do. Okay, then they go to a minor key, and then they, I don't know, maybe they go to an, this key. So they, they go like... Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me see that. Okay. 
coming in it, yeah. So they both a minor key and they play the same melody, but in a different key. And then they start exploring all those things. Then they take the melody and they reverse the whole thing up and down. And then they play these in different keys and so on and so forth. So they try to, co to compose the whole piece of music starting from one idea, but manipulating that idea in several different ways so that you see the, mel the melody straight, the melody reverse, the melody reverse beginning to end, the melody in a different key, the melody taken up and down in the scale, the melody with more variation, with more ornamentation, the melody with less ornamentation, just three notes from the melody, just three notes, take, they take three notes from the melody and they start manipulating that, and then they, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they take one idea and they build a whole piece. Okay, so it's just like an extreme camera movement. They didn't have a concept of camera, of course, at the time, but it's just extreme camera movement around one object, like trying to see all the possible parts of that. Um, these, I like that because it shows a lot of um, technical ability in doing those things. And by studying those pieces, not, not just studying and playing them, but literally opening the score, seeing what they're doing, trying to understand that thought process, it's really enriching. Okay, It's like it shows you, hey, they have all those possible ways <laughs> to, to manipulate a melody. And it's, it, this becomes really useful in today's music too, because people do that too today. They just do it less or less obsessively in a sense, okay? Some people find Baroque music boring because it's one idea stretched for as long as we can. And some people notice and they're, and they're like, no, it's just one idea, <laughs> okay? So that's the thing. But again, you can do the same with lyrics. We can do the same in pop music. Again, maybe not that uh, thoroughly or obsessively. But I've noticed that lots of the best pop songs we have out there do exactly that. Okay, so you realize that, hey, that's the chorus melody, and the intro is the chorus melody reversed, maybe with different chords, but there is something that relates to the chorus, for instance, or the bridge relates to the verse, or there are things that connect all those things together, like they are recycling part of the song for another song, which is essentially just giving a different camera angle on the same idea in music. I mean, I think you could take the, the Baroque variation thing is if you had an, it, exactly as that like if it, it's like a still life and instead of a still life with like lots of artists the music is all of the artists in turn oh from here from there with a the charcoal with a brush um so I, I really like that as a as a and when you say some people find it boring the rate of change is not big enough is not high enough for those people is it could be another way of describing their response to it and uh, definitely this is something that we instinctively do anyway, because we've listened to all this music. When we come to create music, we're probably naturally going to create connection between the ideas when we're improvising. But it's it's almost, um, it's not that we don't recognize it. I think it's just very easy to, to throw away something that still has like loads and loads of expressive potential, because you only looked at it from this side and it didn't look you know didn't look that great if you'd come around to that side it'd have been like ah oh, you'd have revealed all the qualities of this idea so i think that's a, a great asset of starting to think about ideas with this, of this i this lens of how can i get a how can i kind of survey everything about everything that lives in this idea and not throw it away and start on another thing you know it, it's a bit like um your you could make 50 attempts that would be less varied than 50 50 different attempts at something that may be weirdly less varied than the variations you could get by putting uh one idea through a lot of different processes and manipulations like like they do here that that might you know one might need to learn how to do them but they're not sort of creative per se once you know once you have the notion to try something inside out that doesn't make you more creative. You just have a technique that you're now able to use. Then once you've created your iterations, the creativity is, is really the decision-making about what, how much change you want. That's in a sense, I think it's really helpful to think about your creativity residing in the making of decisions, not in the producing of ideas, because there's so many ways to generate material, just like you have shown us. Yes, I, I think one, one of the things is that uh, most... Uh, artists, well, not most beginning artists, most people who are learning how to create art, and that's music, it could be other things, um, they stop too soon, meaning they have an idea, 
they realize it one way and they're like, ooh, that's good, <laughs> okay? When I think people should spend a bit more time or a lot more time trying to see if you can create variations of that idea that will express better what you want. And it's never wasted because if you find 15 different ways to express your ideas, then you can use those 15 ways to create a rate of change, like playing one variation, then another variation, then another variation, so that the thing keeps evolving. And um, I also think that people confine those ideas to a short uh, duration of time, meaning if you have an idea, you use it for a song, then you kind of forget about it. But some ideas are really worth more than one song, <laughs> okay? So you could reuse the same idea on another song as long as you play it in a different way. Right now I'm thinking of Tubular Bells by Mike Holfield. You guys know Tubular Bells by Mike Holfield, no? You know, it's, it's the Exorcist soundtrack, okay? Allfield wrote the first album, Tubular Bells. Then he wrote Tubular Bells 2. <laughs> then he wrote Tubular Bells 3. Then he wrote the Millennium Bell. Then he wrote the Music of the Spheres. He wrote like five albums, and the main theme, it's essentially always the same, but the albums are very different from each other because he uses different instruments, different styles, etc. I mean, Music of the Sphere is, a, is an orchestral album. It does, it's not the, a pop album like the one before. So, um, but it's the same idea. Okay, which is, and not, not only that, but he also lifted the idea from Bach <laughs> because by his own admission, that's the, um, the inverse of a theme that he found in Bach. So my point is, sometimes there is way more juice to be squeezed by one idea by doing all this variation thing. And people really underestimate this variation thing. Okay, I mean, to give another example, how many songs have the exact same chord progression. I mean, how many songs follow the... this chord progression? If you, you... You know, you know, there was this... Um, there was this video years ago of this band, The Flight of the Concord, called Four Chords, and they played those four chords, and, the, and every time they repeat, they sing a different famous song on top. And this one is an old video. And in the meantime, we compose hundreds more <laughs> pop songs on those exact four chords, okay? And more keep being composed because it's not just the chords. The chords are just a scaffolding in, over which you can compose your lyrics, your melody, put the different rhythm, change the instrumentation, change some other details and make something interesting, okay? So really some ideas, are worth a lot more than just uh, um, than just one song. Now consider also that these, which is the four chord, what we call the four chord pop chord progression. Okay, it's actually a variation of uh, uh, of of a very 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 old um, cliche called the Romanesca, which is. Everybody recognized these as the beginning of the Pachel Bells canon, okay? But there's been hundreds of other songs composed way before the rock era that have the exact same beginning, <laughs> okay? So really, some ideas are worth more and more and more, okay? And then, the more variation you compose, the more you can use those as pictures in your animation, if you want, like, from here, we go here, we go here, and every picture is a different variation, and you can mm, start to control what you what we call the rate of change right now, okay? Okay. So, so well, what do you have to say to this, Diana, before Well, we I was going to, Warren has written, aka the Axis progression, yes, I was going to say it, Axis of Orson, um, this Australian band. And what's funny is that there's a, a guy with a lot of adverts on YouTube for his piano method. He's using the exact same examples in the same order as the Axis of Awesome. And every time it pops up, I'm like, couldn't you have just tried a bit harder? <laughs> just find some different ones or put them in a different order. I don't know. Anyway, um, so yes, and someone has written, is it a good idea? I saw a comment further down. Um, perhaps a useful exercise for us would be to examine songs we like to see to see how they're achieving basically the same things. That is an excellent idea. 
because it that's also going to tell you roughly what the rate of change that you find satisfying is and you can almost strip out all the music from a song but keep the information about the change factors and then create your own song using the same rate of changes but with new musical elements and that should be it's not going to maybe sound anything like the song you based it on and so it won't be derivative in that sense but you will have sort of a template that's you're likely to find pleasing for the amount of change that you want to create and when you were talking about change in different aspects i was sort of made me think of um life um life on mars by david bowie da 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 and then the chords are wandering around actually the chords are i think it's one of the few examples of a pop song with diminished chords so the chords are quite adventurous and they're not really diatonic but it feels very smooth because we have this unifying feature of that that little rhythm um and what's that one say let's find yeah so all the way to the chorus he's doing that that same rhythm and it really helps us to follow what's happening and it helps us experience the chords underneath smoothly. It helps us not to experience those as being too much change. And also, I think if I think about the melody, it's not moving. The melody is not moving a whole lot. So that's there's a balance between our. You know, if you think that you could be changing the rhythm, you could be changing the chords, you could be changing the melody, you could be changing how long the phrases are musically and lyrically. He is not changing too many things at the same time. He's like, I'm that the chord style is right up, but the rhythm, the rhythm dial's staying the same. So that can be another helpful way to think about the rate of change and how what's being revealed in, in what's being added in terms of musical and narrative meaning in all of these from these different perspectives, musically and lyrically. Yeah, yeah, Life of Mars yeah, is actually a, a little masterclass in variation because, like you say, the rhythm is the same. The theme is pretty much the same. So the unifying thing, like you say, is the theme. The melody is very similar, but it's putting in diminished chord, it's going into different keys, and he goes in another, another key again, and so on and so forth. It never comes back to the beginning, and then he gets into the chorus. It's, it's a little masterclass. And the... Uh, I think he actually wrote it specifically trying to see how far it could go harmonically by holding the theme and the rhythm the same. Um, well, there's a whole story behind the song, as you know. You, you know the story behind Life of Mars? Mars. No, um, tell me the story behind Life of Mars. Okay, there, I've seen this, there's a video where they interview David Bowie and, and it's like, uh, and telling the story. And the story is more or less that they ask him to do the translation of a French song. And they ask him and Paul Anka. And Paul Anka at the, at the end won the translation, and that song became My Way by Frank Sinatra, sung by Frank Sinatra. So the original was a French song, and the lyrics are by Paul Anka. But and David Bowie was like, Yeah, of course, the translation by Paul Anka, it's not a translation, he actually wrote a completely new song, but it's better than what David Bowie did. And David Bowie admitted that, but he was still pissed about it. <laughs> it was like because he, he didn't like to lose that. It was one of the first uh, uh, gig he got to do that. So it's like, why don't I take part of what I, tra I, I translate, but I change the story. And then I take the same four chord, beginning four chords, the, same, the beginning four chords of my way and the beginning four chords of life of Mars are the same. But then I do my own thing. And this was like his answer to my way. Okay. That is and, that's amazing. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, I actually recommend anybody to go and search the interview as well because it, it gives more details. And honestly, when he, when he tells the story, it's hilarious. So, um, but essentially, it, it's it's kind of his revenge against not being able to write for Frank Sinatra. Okay, and, and, David and, Bowie's and, way. That is Bowie. David <laughs> Bowie way is right. Is you know, it's quite adventurous. The Frank yeah. Sinatra yeah. way is like just barreling down the street, being fairly traditional. Yeah, but again, yeah. it was a translation of a French song, and the French song was barreling down the way that that that, that way. So um, it was that period where um, it was very customary to buy a song from from another author in a different language than a translation, and they were, we were doing this in all possible direction: French to English, English to Italian, Italian to Swedish. I mean, <laughs> you, you see all those kind of things. Um, because it was good business at the time. When you have a good song, why don't translate it and gain a completely new market? Um, 
but yeah david bowie did, did, did this thing and uh, and it's again it's very adventurous harmonically and uh, actually to sit down and completely understand that chord progression require you to be pretty good at music theory <laughs> it's really sometimes it's doing like thing hey what's doing here it's pretty interesting maybe one day I just go playing it's more. quite a quite a good start Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. maybe one day i should go and analyze the whole thing and do a video on youtube on that if i if i get enough comments on that guys i may do it uh so but yeah but coming back yes you can as long as you keep one thing fixed the other thing can change most people do that go the default option like i keep the key fixed and the chord progression fixed and then i change the lyrics or the melody etc but David Bowie is doing exactly the opposite. No, why don't I keep the, 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 the melody and the rhythm of the melody fixed as much as I can and change the harmony and go somewhere else? And since he's doing this really well, people don't notice how far this song is going. <laughs> okay, it's, it's crazy. But again, like you say, it's controlling the rate of change. And to control the rate of change, essentially you have two variables. You can decide the thing that change, how often do they change? But you can also decide the proportion of how many things change and how many things stay the same. So you decide 50% stay the same, 50% change, or 10% stays the same, 90% change in the next bar, which is probably too much in general. So you can decide how many things, the rhythm, the harmony, the melody, uh, the lyrics, uh, the instrumentation, um, the dynamic, how loud or soft. Okay, you, you have a number of things, elements that you can keep the same, or change now um there's this comment here what do you think of that yeah i think that's a great idea and when i'm in when i kind of have a new intake of songwriting students i want the kind of number one day one first instruction is make a list of your five to ten favorite songs and then we keep coming back to that list to look for different specific things so I think it's definitely a good idea to analyze songs that you like and see what the artist does to make it interesting. Or in a way, yeah, and you can look out for things that are interesting and you can also look out for things that are not boring. And that might sound like it's the same, but I don't think it is the same. So when I went through the, uh, the kind of way that the lyric develops in Driver's License, I'd say that that's not boring. Um, I'm not, um, rather than, it, like I'm following the story without being bored and I don't notice that it's interesting. I don't mean that as an insult, but I can, for example, when I hear change, when I hear uh, life on Mars, I'm thinking, oh, the chords are interesting. Like I'm, I'm definitely immediately drawn to that stands out more, but you don't necessarily want things to stick out too much until you want them to. Um, so looking out for things that are interesting is really helpful but also songs that you like where it's just going by in a way that's effective and satisfying, I think is really interesting as well. Because what she's doing is she's managing to not bore us by moving the spotlight around in, a, in, a, in an effective way. And so there might be songs, and country's a really great example, where there, there tends to be perhaps more of a, um, a narrower palette of chords. And then there has to be more interest in the storytelling to sort of perhaps balance that so yeah i would say great idea to analyze the songs that you like and see what the artist did to make it interesting but there's the bits that catch your attention and then there's the bits that just slide by perfectly well and you need both of them i think yeah, yeah. because again you need again, something something that change but it needs something that keeps stays the same so noticing what stays the same or it's very very smooth it's important especially if you actually want to write a song i mean these exercises can be done at two levels. I mean, it's like, okay, I'm interested in how this is done. So you just notice those things. Great. But it can also be done at a deeper level when you actually want to write songs yourself. So you need to get more of a working knowledge of all that. So if you actually get, if you guys want to actually write songs, um, the recommendation is analyze some other songs. Great. Do that. But also experiment a lot meaning to literally try and take an, a musical idea and say, okay, what happens if I change this, but don't, I, I don't change that. Record that little part and listen back to it. What happens if I change another thing and then record it and listen, record it. And, so they have to experiment a lot to see what's the optimal rate of change when you are doing it, okay? 
And there's also this other thing here. Sudden guitar technique make me feel like I should overcomplicate my songwriting, but all my favorite songs can be reduced to cowboy chords. Okay, here's the thing. All songs can be reduced to cowboy chords. <laughs> okay, pretty much. Um, but some songs do require more technical, a, a more technical higher level to be played. What I would suggest, but and then I can, can give her a recommendation in a second, but what I, I would suggest is you want to have a good structure, and then if you want, you want to also have good playing on it. So don't think about guitar technique, for instance, as songwriting technique. Think about guitar technique as the pool of available things you have, but don't don't think as since we you can do something on guitar that should also become a songwriting technique. Okay, that's so two slightly different things. Okay, Diana, what do you have to say to this? Yes, so I think having more guitar technique is great, but. You, it's almost that's like another it's another one of your our little dials that we can turn. Let's say you, we're going back to our G and C song, and that could be a cowboy song. But now, because you've got more guitar technique, you can create a little ostinato in in an instrumental section. You can have one guitar track that's giving you G and C. You can have another way going, and you know. So that's now gives you another set of possibilities to to ornament that song or to that, and that's going to change the rhythmic feel. I mean, obviously do any um, melody or ostinato or anything you want or you suddenly if you're going to play some of these chords um, that's I think that's a no that's that's a G and this is a C not sounding very cowboy now is it um, sounding but and then you let's say that's that's the cowboy on his own at night in the moonlight thinking about his favorite horse that died and then he's he's overcome his moment of sorrow so i think it just all of your guitar technique just gives you more ways of being expressive but they can still exist within the same chord parameters um and you can you're now your g is something you can express in a lot of different ways you could also choose to play many chords quickly and have a complex chords because you're going to be able to find them and your guitar technique is going to allow you to potentially play melodies that, that unify them. But it, it's almost like you've got your field of, the, of the, the chord and then your technique is all the different plants you can have in that field or all the different crops. You, you know, you can have potatoes and carrots. Now you can make a lovely dinner. Whereas if you only had limited technique, you, you've got potatoes. Fortunately for you, it seems that you have potatoes, orchards, you know, a flock of alpaca. And by the way, that doesn't mean, again, that you have to limit yourself to anything. I have seen Diana performing on stage, okay, when she was playing her own songs. And some of those songs have ridiculously complicated rhythm parts that she performs while she's singing on top of them. So, I mean, I've seen Diana play... Um, Odd time signatures is repeating parts while she's singing. So, and again, can we reduce that to cowboy chords? Yes, technically we can. She's playing on a specific chord progression and singing a specific melody. But the effect is completely different when she renders the chord progression as a repeating rhythmic part and singing on top. First of all, it's more impressive, <laughs> but but also musically, it's more satisfying for the specific kind of music she was doing. So I, I I know she's modest and she will not really, she will not say that I mean I like, but I'm telling you that she can do stuff on the guitar that is very very technical and she's able to put this to good use in a songwriting uh, context essentially so you think again of, of guitar technique as possibilities that, that you are acquiring for rendering those chord progression or rendering those songs and you use them whenever they are appropriate, okay? So it's not overcomplicating. It's complicate them when it makes sense for the song to be complicated at that moment. Otherwise, just play it simple, <laughs> okay? That's a, a kind of a heuristic, if you want, okay? Okay. And we can talk so the, a lot about, about. The, the 
when Tomasa saw me do that, it was a song that has a four chord chorus. And I was playing it by myself and we were on like the fourth chorus. And I I just wanted to hear it differently. Um, I can't, yeah, so the whole sweep singing thing is brilliant and I love it, but it's high risk. Um, it can go wrong. But, but even if you just do it for a bar or two, it interrupts the rhythm and it interrupts from if you would be playing in that particular song, I think it's playing kind of power chords. Um, if you, as soon as you're doing this, instead of a power chord, now it's a totally different vibe. You can go back into your power chords or open chords afterwards and they don't sound, the effect isn't as repetitive as if you've done that all the way through because we've had this rhythm and pitch range change in, in how, we're, how we're experiencing them. So if you did only, even if I could sustain like three minutes of singing over sweep arpeggios, that would be boring. And there would be like, you know, there wouldn't be any bottom end in it really, or not very much. So it's not, it's it's just, but I just dropped it in there for, for that last chorus to give me a little interval so then I could finish strong. But um, it's exactly, it's a great example because it was a very bog standard chord progression. It was like a six, one, four, five or six, four, one, five or something. Um, um, so yes, basically just confirming what Tomasa was saying there. And that's a follow-up comment follow always from Warren. Comment. It's like you, I was throwing away ideas because I thought they were too simple. Oh, you see, but, 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 but now, yeah, uh, yeah, see, that's the see, problem. That's the problem. Uh, that's the problem. So, but like then I was saying, the sweep picking thing worked because there were power chords before. And so again, rate of change, breaking the previous rhythm and center. But you need the simple version to create this kind of contrast. So when you have simple ideas, don't think of them like that's a simple idea. Period. Think of them as one pole, if you want, of the idea, okay, one, one side of the idea, and then create a different idea, I, I mean, variation of the same idea that is more complex. And even if this, the other variation is only moderately more complex, once you start playing first the simple version, then the more complex version, you create some movement. And that could be satisfying, even if the idea, the idea one and sorry, variation one and variation two are very simple per se. So don't throw away the simple stuff. Okay, use the simple stuff as a contrast with the complex stuff, and the complex stuff will feel more complex. And I mean, think about it. Regardless, I mean, I don't know what kind of style you play, but let's take let's take some very complex styles of music, like I don't know, progressive metal. Okay, just, just to pick something that is ridiculously complex on purpose. But still, in any progressive metal song, there is a moment where they just play power chords. Just think about it. Okay, they're not playing playing ridiculous arpeggios all the time, super fast scales all the time. Occasionally, there is just a power chord. They don't sit down and think, maybe I should not play the power chord in this one point because it's too simple. They just play it. It gives contrast to the other stuff. Okay, so okay. again, don't, don't think in terms of absolute simplicity or complexity. Start thinking in terms of, I have this and I have that, and then try to contrast those things. Okay, don't throw away stuff because they are too simple. <laughs> the other point is that, um we've been talking about progression within a song but let's say that you write a few songs and now you have a set of your original material and you might be or you might be working towards that you don't really want to hear the same song you know it's across a set of material it's nice for there to be also a kind of rhythm of how intense those songs are and um i do have a fondness for somewhat of a dense amount of musical material and I remember recording a rehearsal and I was like, oh Lord, that's like, I'm getting exhausted by the fourth song. Um, uh, there's that thumb thing again. So, so and, and I always make sure to include one of the simpler songs that maybe just has four chords in the whole song because otherwise it becomes too much. So the other people that are hearing your music for the first time, if you're somebody that writes complicated music, they don't know it. So they're like doing a, it's a lot to ask of your listener. So there's the, rate of change within a song but there's also the rate of change between the songs in your set if that is what you're working towards and it can be such a relief to have a nice simple song that people can immediately understand and compute and get their heads around and you might feel like oh i feel like this is too simple but it's kind of satisfying that simplicity for people so and you might find it sim satisfying yourself if you get past the idea that it should be more sophisticated which you know i don't worry it's taken me a long time to, if anyone, if that applies to anyone else, I, I see you. 
been been there done that same deal <laughs> okay it, it takes time to relax into the simplicity of some ideas and just say okay that, that this is enough to carry the song and to do what what i want to do it takes a, a, a bit you know you need to trust in, the, in those ideas so anyway it takes anyway. a lot of confidence because when something is simple it's very clear what it is if it's complicated you can almost hide behind the complexity when it's simple it's more direct and that can feel a lot more vulnerable as a songwriter but anyway so there's a there's a funny there's that aspect to it as well maybe we should do um maybe on the next live stream we maybe meet each other either on my channel or your, your channel we should do something about uh, vulnerability and directness sure that would be okay. that would, that would be, that interesting. be interesting um, um anyway any we start to be late so <laughs> okay diana i know you have something uh, for our viewers uh, and now i need to find the whole thing there we go there we go Yes. So this is all the things I'd wish I'd known when I started out with writing lyrics. As I mentioned earlier, my uh, understanding of it when I started out was just, oh, we start with like one line one, and then we try and write the whole song. And I don't know what we put in what section. We just trying to get words that some of them should rhyme. And then we hope that the band does not laugh and make us feel bad. Um, that was pretty much my, as far as I knew what was happening. And I was writing music in bands in London around the time of the Libertines and they all treated songwriting as if it was this holy power that you were blessed with or not blessed with. And I think that's, you know, if I'd known what I know now, I would have been not as intimidated by those people and that scene. So yes, it just has uh, ways for you to think about getting material and then ways also that you can think about applying change to that material. And some of the, some of the things that we've spoken about today in terms of how long the sections are going to be, how you think about rhyme, and how you get ideas, how you get yourself in the flow of writing so that you can discover what it is that you might want to write about, because sometimes these things are not necessarily obvious. Sometimes we have to chisel away to, to, to find out. So basically, it's got a set of perspectives on thinking about lyric writing and a set of activities that you can do, and I think it's even a little calendar at the end, to get you going with your lyric writing and also to get you evaluating and thinking about your lyrics in such a way that they support your expressive goal, rather than just thinking, oh, these are good, I, I like them, or these are bad, I don't like them. Because those are not very helpful. If, you, if you're like, these are good because I really like how the rhythm fits the, the song. It, it's nice being precise. If you just toss something away because you don't like it, but you don't know why, you're, you're kind of stuck in, in stabbing in the dark. So it's got a few ways for you to think about how you can fix lyrics that are not satisfying, as well as lots of ways to get you started. And I would recommend yeah, I would that recommend e ebook also to anybody, anybody who's writing, writing instrumental, instrumental music, music and never and writes lyrics, lyrics because the ideas in it are, can be applied in instrumental music. Too. Very good. So, and then also, whoop, wrong button. There is another thing that I want to give you guys. That's another free thing. This is uh, 18 tips to make your pentatonic solo sound professional. It's a free book. When we talk about how to play something and create variations over variations over variations, if you like to play guitar solos, this little ebook here contains ideas and ideas and ideas on how to create variations, essentially. Okay. Because the way we play something is more important, or at least, or at least as important as what exactly we are playing. So if you find yourself that your music bites its tail and it's always the same, et cetera, et cetera, whenever you improvise a solo, et cetera, have a look at this ebook. Again, it's free. You don't have to learn all the 18 tips. You can learn only one or two, okay? And this adds something immediately to your playing. And then if you want more along this line, I have more, but have a look at this first, okay? And again, it's important to know how to create variations. That's what we do as musicians, create something, create variation, change the whole thing, and control this rate of change toward the emotional effect that we want to have, okay? Now, very good. So, Diana, thank you, thank you. for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming to the live stream. I always like when I talk to you because we have you have lots of interesting ideas, and we agree on a lot of those things, and we bounce into each other. So, likewise, I enjoy entering the world of baroque psychedelia. 
Oh, and they asked me if I can uh, if I can plug uh, your your book again. I can totally plug the Anna book again, no problem. So let me put it on. There we go. But you find also the link in the description of the video on YouTube and Facebook. So you just need to click on the click there and get the ebook. Okay. Again, totally recommend that you guys go there to take the ebook. Everybody who came today, thank you for coming. I'm gonna have. Uh, you're going to have Diana maybe another time too in future, okay? Because people always request that. So thank you, Diana, for coming. Thank you very much for having me. And have everybody, weekend, everybody, until next time, enjoy. <laughs>